Welcome to Astro 101, The Sun and Its Neighbors. I'm Professor Bart Netterfield. In today's lecture, lecture number 19, we're going to be looking at how we explore the solar system. What are the various types of space probes that exist? And how do they work? What's involved with making them work? It's going to be a really kind of a fun, a fun lecture. At the end of it, I'm going to talk a bit about what I do when I'm not teaching Astro 101. What is my research? And it's some really cool stuff, at least I think so. That's why I do it. Anyway, um, let's get on with it. How do we look at space? Now, you can just look at space from the ground with a telescope. And uh, maybe, maybe we've all looked at the sky from the ground, even without a telescope. But there's something that kind of causes a challenge for us when we look at the sky, and that is the air that we live in. We, we have an atmosphere. Now, there's obvious reasons an atmosphere can be a problem, like when it's cloudy. When it's cloudy, you can't see the sky. But even when it's clear, the atmosphere causes problems. The first one is, the atmosphere absorbs light that travels through it. So this plot tries to describe um, the way in which the atmosphere um, absorbs light. On this axis, we have the wavelength of light or the different colors of light. Over here, we have ultraviolet light, and then we have the visible spectrum, purple, blue, green, yellow, red. And then we have infrared light. Then we have far infrared light, submillimeter light, microwave light, and finally down here, radio waves. So if you remember from previous lectures, um, the color of the light is determined by the wavelength. On this axis, this tells you how much of the light actually makes it to the Earth from space. So here, in this window here, something like 90% of the light makes it to the surface. So most of the light in these wave bands at 10 microns makes it to the surface. Similarly, over here in the radio waves, almost all the radio waves in hitting the Earth make it to the surface. Here in the visible, well, when you include both scattering and absorption, something like only about half the light actually makes it to you. The other half either gets absorbed by the atmosphere or scattered to form in the daytime the blue sky. So that's a bit of a problem. Half the light that we see on the ground with a telescope makes it to the telescope. The rest gets absorbed or scattered. That's on the ground. That's one of the reasons why you see telescopes built on high mountains to make this effect less. But if visible light's bad, there's other wavelengths where it's even worse. If you look here in this whole band here, through the far infrared into the submillimeter, essentially no light reaches the surface of the Earth. Light comes in from space, and all of it gets absorbed on the ground. If you build a camera that operates in the submillimeter, it can't even see across the street. The air absorbs the light, and it's just absorbed. So if you want to observe anything with these wave bands, well, you have to, well, you can't do it from the ground. Similarly, up here in the x-ray, all of the x-ray light gets absorbed by the atmosphere. So if you want to absorb far infrared or submillimeter light, if you want to observe x-rays, you have to get out of the atmosphere. Consequently, um, NASA and the European Space Agency have built some really great satellites for take, basically satellite telescopes that they, they orbit around the Earth, or in the case of Herschel at L2, which is a place kind of near the Earth. Um, and they look at extremely distant objects. They're telescopes. Their idea is that they are operating outside the atmosphere where the light doesn't get absorbed. So the Chandra X-ray Telescope can look at X-ray sources throughout the galaxy um, and the universe in general. The Herschel Space Telescope can look at submillimeter sources throughout the universe. So if you want to observe Far infrared, submillimeter, if you want to observe x-rays, you need to build a satellite. Other frequencies also can benefit from a, from a satellite. For example, visible light can clearly benefit from a satellite. You'll be more sensitive in space. But that's not a good reason to build a satellite in space because, um, well, putting a satellite in, in space is very expensive and very challenging. So it's probably better just to make a bigger telescope or let it observe longer to make up for this 50% being absorbed, except for one problem. The light, the atmosphere doesn't just absorb light, it also distorts it. Here we have a little video um, taken of the moon through a small telescope. And if you look carefully, you can see the whole image is just bouncing around, being continuously distorted, like we're looking through water or something. That's because the atmosphere, turbulence in the atmosphere bends light as it travels through the atmosphere. 
And so this whole image is continuously bouncing around and getting distorted. This is the same thing that causes stars to twinkle. So if you want to observe something in space, like the moon, through the atmosphere, the moon or Jupiter or anything like that, you're going to face this problem of the atmosphere distorting the image you're looking at. It's called, atmos it's called atmospheric seeing. For long exposures, like you need for dim objects, or it's also true for large telescopes, this effect gets completely smeared out. And so it doesn't just bounce around, you just end up with a very blurry image. So seeing for long exposures just blurs out the image, and for large telescopes it just blurs out the image. So this significantly limits the resolution you can get for telescopes situated on the ground. For, um, there, are, there are some techniques that are being developed that can try to correct for this over very small areas. If you're looking, for one, looking at one very small thing, um, you can correct for some of this. But without these kind of corrections, which are, well, they're, they're starting to work pretty well now. Um, but without these corrections, or if you want to look at a large area, you need to put a telescope in space. That's why um, back um, about 30 years ago now, NASA launched the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope is a 2.5 meter diameter telescope. It's a very, well, relatively large telescope. There are telescopes up to 10 meters on the ground. But Hubble is a fairly large telescope, 2.5 meters in diameter, and it's operating in Earth orbit. By operating in Earth orbit, it's not affected by atmospheric contamination, so you end up with a much clearer image. Here's a picture of a galaxy taken from the ground, and you can see that it's, you know, somewhat smudgy, somewhat blurry. That is because of that atmospheric seeing we were talking about before. The image is continuously being distorted, and then when you take a long exposure to try and see these dim objects, it all gets smeared out. Here is the same galaxy as viewed from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's five to ten, ten times better resolution than you can get from the ground, depending on how good the day is on the ground. In, the, in space, with the Hubble Space Telescope, it's always perfect. And so you get this incredibly high resolution image that you can't get from the ground. So the Hubble Space Telescope is one of the most important scientific instruments that's ever been, ever been built. It's been in orbit now for 30 years and continues to take amazing images of galaxies and um, even the planets. So you can actually see the planets with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's the, here's the Hubble Space Telescope picture of Mars when Mars was at its, at its closest to get the best resolution. Here's a picture of Jupiter and its moon Europa and of Pluto. Now, you can say, well, Mars looks pretty good. Jupiter looks pretty cool. Europa, well, it's pretty fuzzy. And Jupiter is kind of a wash. You can't see anything at all. This is as good as we can do, or pretty close to as good as we can do from Earth. If you want to do better, you're just going to have to go there and get up close and personal and take the pictures. This is where these space probes come, in, come, in, come into play. The problem is, the other problem is that with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can take pictures, but there's a lot of things you can't measure about what's going on around the planet. You can't measure gravity. Remember we talked about learning about um, Jupiter's core by, by Juno orbiting and measuring its acceleration and things very, very carefully. You can't measure gravity from, with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can't measure magnetic fields. You can't measure the radiation. You can't go and land on Mars and measure things about the rocks. You can't measure the wind speeds on Venus if you're, you know, orbiting the Earth. So, you really, at the end of the day, you have to go there. You have to send a probe with multiple instruments. There is a challenge, however. It is hard to get there because the distances are so great. Now, the moon is the closest thing, the closest of these bodies to us. It's only 384,000 kilometers away. So, if you're tra traveling in a jet, maybe an A380 or a 747 or something, um, and you're going to fly to the moon, assuming, imagining that a jet could actually fly through space, which it can, but if it could, it would take you two and a half weeks to get to the moon in a jet traveling at around 1,000 kilometers an hour. Well, 903 kilometers an hour is the speed of an A380, but okay. Um, Mars is a lot further. To get, getting to Mars, it would take you nearly 10 years in a jet. That's a long time. Jupiter, and this is when Mars is at its closest. All these are when Mars is at its closest. That's when we're, the Earth and the Mars are as close as they can get. That's what these distances here are. So 10 years at the closest, much longer at the furthest. Almost 80 years to Jupiter and 550 years to get to Neptune if you were traveling at jet speeds, 1,000 
kilometers an hour. Let's not travel a thousand kilometers an hour. Let's go at a higher speed, maybe at the speed that the space shuttle or the space station orbits. That's around something like 20,000 kilometers an hour to give a round number. At 20,000 kilometers an hour, it only takes ah less than a day to get to the moon. That's great. That's not so bad. Mars, however, is five and a half months. It's a long time to get to Mars. 3.6 years to Jupiter or 25 years to get to Neptune, traveling at 20,000 kilometers an hour. Okay. So this is not going to work. And 20,000 kilometers an hour, in fact, isn't even fast enough. So how are you going to do it? Well, you've got to launch really, really fast. So we talked a bit about the New Horizons probe, this absolutely fantastic probe that was launched um, from Earth um, in, I think, 19, no, 2005. And it reached, um, it reached Pluto in 2015. Its initial speed was 58,500 kilometers per hour. It launched here from Earth. In, in this diagram here, we're going to be seeing the orbits and the trajectories. The pink dot is New Horizons. The blue circle is Earth's orbit. The yellow one is Mars's, Mars's orbit. The red one is Jupiter's orbit. Out here is New Horizons orbit. And this one here is Akaros, Ar Arakos orbit. So let's watch um, how this flight went. It was launched from Earth, traveling at um, 50,500 kilometers per hour, scooted past Jupiter, um, and then made a very close encounter with Pluto, and then a very close encounter with Akaroth. So started out traveling at 58,500 kilometers per hour. This number down here is in kilometers per second, so you can convert those. But this was the um, fastest um, object ever launched from Earth. Um, that was a uh, New Horizons. And even so, even being the fastest object ever launched from Earth, it still took 10 years to make it out to Pluto. Well, nine and a half years. Very, very cool. But now you get this very high resolution image of Pluto. Much better picture than we had from, um, from the Earth. Now, there's another problem here. It, when it passed, passed Pluto, it was traveling at 52,000 kilometers per hour. So it wasn't within camera range of Pluto for very long at all. It just whipped by. You have one chance to take the pictures and you're going to keep on going. Why? Because it would be incredibly challenging to slow New Horizons down to get it into orbit around Pluto. How would you do it? To slow it down, you need a rocket the sizes you launched it with to slow it back down again. And that would mean the launch rocket you launched it with would have to be able to ro launch that rocket. You'd end up with a rocket that's much too large to consider launching. So it's really almost impossible for us to stop an orbit around Pluto and get there in any kind of reasonable time. So that's why we had to do what's called a flyby mission. Pluto is flown by by New Horizons. New Horizons flies by Pluto and then flies by Arakoth. Now, one of the advantages of a flyby mission um, is that once you've gone past your first target, you can look for another target and, and try and redirect a little bit and go past it. Arakoth wasn't even known to exist when um, New Horizons was launched. But they, got, they applied to get an extension to the mission. They used various telescopes to find another object out in the Kuiper Belt. They made some minor corrections to um, New Horizons' direction and managed to pass very close to Arakoth and take a picture of this very strange object, object out in the Kuiper Belt made of kind of reddish ices. Very strange, very interesting object. Um, so that's an advantage of a flyby mission. You can look at more than one target. The most famous of all of these we've already learned about, that was the good old Voyager probe, which launched from Earth, visited Jupiter, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Absolutely fantastic mission, um, seeing all four of these. It used each planet's gravity to accelerate and change directions. We're going to look at that in a minute, what that meant. Um, there were two, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and they're still operating. They're 20 light hours away from the Earth. It's, these are incredible, incredible machines. Um, you remember um, a while back, uh, we, um, I, I, I actually brought in Voyager for us to look at, landed on the street. That was very cool. This right here, incidentally, is the telescope, and there's other instruments all along here. Megatometers, radiation sensors, um, 
many of them are still operating. Now, it was launched in the 70s and it's still going. Absolutely phenomenal instrument. We're going to hear about this in a minute. This is the, the communications dish for looking back at the Earth. Okay, so Voyager Space Probe, an amazing thing. Um, it was launched August 20th, 1977. Um, it passed Jupiter a couple years later, used Jupiter to speed up. We're going to explain that in a second. Then it went past Saturn um, two years after that. Again, used Saturn to speed up. Finally got to Uranus in 86, nine years after it launched, and then 12 years after it launched, it passed Neptune. Once it passed Neptune, um, its direction had changed. It was actually traveling out of the plane. So it's, no it's now sc scooting down further out of the plane. Um, Voyager doesn't have the ability to, to, to change direction anymore, so it's just going in the direction it's going, and it will continue to do so. Um, amazing, amazing uh, machine Voyager was. Um, so these are what we call fly-by missions. You launch them, and they fly by their targets, taking pictures and making measurements as they go by. They go by very fast. They don't have much time, but you can get some incredibly great information in a very short period of time. Now I mentioned this idea of a gravity assist, as the, the where the, the we can use um, planets to speed up and change the direction of a probe. So imagine here in this in this right here, imagine here the black is Jupiter traveling and the blue is the probe. Um, if the probe travels behind the um, planet but gets close, it will bend its orbit. Right? It's on a hyperbolic orbit. It'll bend the orbit and come out to a new direction. Um, if it comes in behind the planet, the planet kind of pulls it along and speeds up the uh, probe. So the probe ends up going faster after the interaction than before. So you can use a planet to both change the direction of your probe and to give it ex extra speed. And it can be quite a bit of extra speed. Um, if you need to slow down, you can pass in front of the planet it'll change direction and slow it down. So um, right now, the, um, Parker Space, this, the Parker Solar Probe, which is trying to look at the sun, trying to get as close as possible to the sun, has been orbiting and doing passes by Venus to try and slow its orbit down so that it can get closer and closer to the sun. Um, that's pretty cool. So let's take a look here and how it worked out with um, Voyager. Voyager was launched at, zero, at this distance from the sun here at 35 kilometers per second. But because it was going away from the Earth and going away from the Sun, it slowed down. Gravity is slowing it down, slowing it down, slowing it down. As it gets further and further from the Sun, the Sun is pulling on it, trying to slow it down. So it's been slowing down until it gets to Jupiter. It does this slingshot maneuver around Jupiter, which bursts its speed way back up, and then it slows down, leaving Jupiter. And then it's going away from the Sun, it's slowing down again. But now it's going a much higher speed than it had been before the Jupiter interaction. In fact, it was not going fast enough even to escape. It, was, it would not even have made it to Saturn. But because of the interaction with Jupiter, the slingshot sped up the speed of um, Jupiter, and so of the probe rather. So now, after leaving Saturn, it's going even at a much higher speed again. Then it had another, redirect, another interaction with Uranus, which sped it up a little bit again, and changed the direction so that it could interact with new Neptune. When it got to Neptune, they were no longer worried about speeding it up or slowing it down. They just wanted to make sure when it got to Neptune, it could bend around so they could get close to Triton because they wanted to take pictures of Triton to understand what it was. And so, in, in, in fact, it turned out that on the interaction with Neptune, um, the spacecraft slowed down a little bit. So this is, this is you know, kind of the most impressive of the flyby missions, Voyager 2, using slingshots around um, the various planets to get to change the direction and to speed up. Very cool. All right, next topic. Sometimes you don't want to just go whipping by the other planet. And if there was a way of actually getting there and getting into orbit around it, that would be much better if you could build an orbiter instead of a flyby mission. To do that, you have to use what's called a transfer orbit. And here is how the idea works. Let's imagine you're here orbiting around the Earth um, at one in the inner orbit and you want to get out to this outer orbit, orbit, say maybe the orbit of Mars. How are you going to do this? Well, what you do is at the right moment, you fire your rocket engines on your spacecraft. You do a single burn and you speed yourself up. Now remember, if you're in orbit and you speed up, what happens to the orbit? You go from a circular orbit 
into an elliptical orbit that goes further out. You, you give the burn that's just enough so that the new elliptical orbit will come and meet the um, circular orbit you're trying to get to. Now, if you didn't do anything, you'd just be in this new elliptical orbit. You do it at just the right moment so that when the thing you're trying to, trying to, to intercept gets to where you want to be, you fire another burn to speed up into the speed of the red object. So this way, we can go from an inner orbit to a more distant orbit. Now, this is all assuming that ignoring the mass of the, of the, of the ob objects you're orbiting around to start with. So let's say that we're going to meet uh, an asteroid rather than Mars. This would be a pretty good approximation. If, it's, if you're going to meet Mars, you need to do something different because you need to actually get into orbit around Mars. And so, in fact, you need to slow down a little bit, not speed up in order to get around Mars. But that's, it. nonetheless, this is a fairly low energy approach to get from one planet to another. It really mostly works well if either um, it's fairly close or um, the thing you're going to um, has enough gravity that you can get into orbit around it without too much of an expenditure of fuel. During this time when you're going from two to four during period three, you're just coasting. There's no fuel being used. You only use fuel at the beginning and fuel when you get to your target. This is called a transfer orbit. Um, it takes somewhere between six months of this orbit and six months of this orbit to get to the new tar target. So it's going to be not fast, but it's low energy and you can, you can get there. So this is the kind of thing that's used, for example, to go put orbiters around um, Mars. So one very cool um, Mars mission was called the Mars Global Surveyor. It's currently in orbit around Mars. Um, it, it, it made high resolution images of Mars from 1999 until 2006. It had a large camera or small telescope mounted on it, solar, pa solar panels for power. It orbited Mars. Um, it's still orbiting Mars, but for seven years, it took really great, highly detailed picture images of the entire surface of Mars. Very, very cool. For example, um, here's some, just a few pictures that I, that, I, that I pulled up here. We have this picture of a crater with these really strange structures, this layered la layers um, in the dirt, which has been worn away. Um, we have uh, evidence of erosion. We have an old crater that's being cleared away by, by, by erosion. We have what looks like river, dry riverbeds, um, what looks like um, places where there have been uh, glaciers. Um, here, this is really cool. This is a dust devil traveling across the Martian um, desert. And there it is. You can see the shadow of the dust devil. Um, learned a lot about Mars. Learned a lot about the structure of Mars. Now, in 2006, it quit working. Why did it quit working? Well, there was a, some confusion about sending commands to the instrument. The wrong things got sent. It didn't get noticed that they were wrong. It drove the um, solar panel pointer to the stop and broke the solar panels and uh, then it spun out it turned out of control overheated the battery and the whole thing um, shut down so I guess the lesson there is if any of you are computer science majors um, the user interface really matters that so that's kind of this was a user interface error you could say it's a user error but I'm gonna call it a user interface error In any case Mars global surveyor was supposed to work for a year. It worked for seven years. They wanted to keep working it, but they but it got broken. So nonetheless, very cool. And also, it's kind of scary to reprogram a satellite in orbit because things can go wrong. Okay, so um, another really cool instrument we, we talked about, that was the Juno mission to Jupiter. It's there right now. Um, it was launched in 2011. And this was a really cool thing. It used both a gravity assist and a transfer orbit to get to to Jupiter. So let's watch it when it comes here. It's going to get here in a second. The blue is the Earth. The green is Mars. It launches from Earth and does an orbit and comes back around and uses Earth as a, um, as a slingshot to boost it out to Juno, out to Jupiter. Isn't that cool? And so then after it's past Earth, it's on a transfer orbit it would have continued around in an ellipse, but um, it managed to slow down the right amount to get caught into Jupiter's gravity and is now in orbit around Jupiter. Boop. There it is. So it fired 
here. And then it fired again um, when it got into, into Jupiter's orbit. So that's Juno. Juno is really great. It has nine different instruments, including a camera. It measures gravity, magnetic fields, radiation, infrared, UV spectra, radio emissions. And it is, of course, learning a ton about Jupiter, including, as we said um, last class, that Jupiter doesn't have a well-defined core. So really great, interesting, interesting mission. Um, it's going to be running now for a couple more years. Um, actually, July 2021 is when it's going to be out of uh, the ability to, to maneuver. They're going to crash it into Jupiter um, to make sure that it doesn't hit Europa, just in case there's bacteria still on Juno and there's life on Europa. They, they don't want to contaminate Europa with Juno. So they're going to burn it up in the atmosphere of Jupiter where, they'll, where they're sure it's going to get um, fully uh, 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 sterilized. Okay, so... That is the Juno mission to Jupiter. Next. Sometimes you need to go beyond orbiting. Sometimes you actually need to land. If you remember pictures of Venus, Venus is just a cloud, a ball of clouds. You cannot see through the clouds. That is why um, the Soviets spent a lot of effort to land a probe on Venus. So the, the Venera series of missions, these were missions from the Soviet Union designed to land on Venus. And they had a number of successes. This is one of the hardest things you can imagine. Um, the temperature on Venus is 457 degrees Celsius. That is much hotter than your oven. Um, the pressure is 89 atmospheres. That is 89 times more pressure than on Earth. It's really dense. But these, the spacecraft actually managed to land on Venus, survived the landing, and survived sitting on Venus in this in this oven, this high pressure oven, for 127 minutes. It survived, and it took some really cool pictures. Here's a picture of the surface of Venus. It's okay. Yeah, it's a hideous, hideous place. But man, they pulled it off. They they discovered the wind speeds were very low. They did, they did some experiments to learn what kind of rock it was. Um, very, very cool experiment. Incredibly hard, but they managed to do several landings of spacecraft on Venus. Now, obviously, um, this thing lands on Venus and that's the spot it gets to measure. It landed there, it measures there. You can learn a lot from looking at one place. But if you really want to explore a world, you'd like to be able to drive around because a world is bigger than just one place. Now, even if you drive around, you can't drive around the whole planet, but you can do better than just one spot. Um, I don't know how you'd build a, a, a probe that could drive around on Venus and have it be able to survive these kind of temperatures and pressures. But an easier place to drive a probe around is Mars. And so the United States has sent now four different um, rovers to Mars. The original one was this thing called Sojourner, um, launched back in 1997. It was a little test bed just to see if it if they could pull it off, and it worked pretty well. Then they built two of these, Spirit and Opportunity, which drove around starting in 2004. Um, Opportunity lasted 15 years and traveled a to total of 45 kilometers. Spirit got st stuck a little bit before that because uh, sand got into the bearings and the motors quit, and it, it got stuck before this. But Opportunity lasted 15 years, traveled 45 kilometers, and explored, you know, more than just one place. And finally, the most recent is Curiosity, which is a much larger machine. It's still running. It's traveled 23 and a half kilometers as of November, 20, uh, November 26, that's today, uh, 2020. Um, here is a picture of um, Curiosity on Mars taken by a camera on the, um, launch, on the landing system. So this is where um, uh, uh, Curiosity has traveled so far. It's landed here up in Bradbury Landing, and it's traveled along here, travel along here, travel along here, now along there, along there, along there, and it's now here. And they're continuing, continuing to explore and just get an idea what's Mars like. So they're learning a ton. Now, getting this thing onto, the, onto Mars is hard. Remember that they could land onto Venus. They have a really thick atmosphere. So in fact, using a parachute is relatively easy. The air on Mars is incredibly thin. So when you're going very, 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 very fast, you can use a parachute to try and slow down a bit. But it doesn't take long before, well, you can't get going very slow with a parachute when there's almost no air. 
So the question is, how do you get this thing down to the ground? The answer is a crazy system of rockets and landing platforms, and you wouldn't believe it. It is one of the most nuts things I've ever seen. Um, NASA has this fantastic video on YouTube. So do a search for seven minutes of terror, Curiosity Rover's risky Mars landing. And I'll put a link to it um, on the course page if, um, if you have access to that. But I recommend watching this. It's completely nuts getting this thing onto the surface of Mars without, um, without breaking anything. Amazing. So Mars rovers. There's been more. There's also rovers on the moon. Um, recently, uh, China put a rover on the far side of the moon, which is a really amazing feat. But I think so far there's only been rovers on uh, the moon and on Mars. Um, there have been landers, also, as we said, on Venus and on Titan. Okay. So rovers. Next. Now, one thing I didn't mention, but this um, Curiosity here has a, it's basically a tra traveling lab. It's got a ton of different experiments. It's got cameras, it's got drills, it's got chem chemistry and geology instruments. It's got weather, it's got a weather station. It can measure radiation, it can detect ice. It's, it's basically a traveling geology lab, but it's not that big of a traveling geology lab. There's a lot of things that it can't measure. If you really want to understand the material, if you really want us to understand the rocks, Curiosity can't really go all the way for you. It would be much better and much more useful. You get a lot more information if you can actually bring samples back to the Earth. And that's where you get to these things called sample return missions. So um, we talked about already OSIRIS-REx, the satellite which went and grabbed samples off the asteroid Bennu. You grab the samples that close them up and put them into this return vessel. Um, this is the heat shield here. And this return vessel will be sent back to the Earth. It's going to come whipping. Um, it's going to come back in. It's going to come in on parachute and, then, and land um, for analysis. And it's going to be getting back in 2023. We're going to be able to take chunks. Well, we um, geologists will take chunks of Bennu and analyze them. What is Bennu? made of. Very interesting because Bennu is made of material that date from the very beginning of the solar system and very little has happened to it in the last four and a half billion years. So this is going to be a great look into what was the original material of the solar system made from. So this is a return mission. As we go up, we started with flybys, which are great, but you don't get a lot of data. You just whip by, take some measurements, you got a few minutes and you're gone. So that's cool. The next step is you, if, if you really want to measure the system better, you'd like to be, build an orbiter. You can orbit the planet, orbit the object, and spend a lot of time taking pictures and making measurements, making gravity measurements, making magnetic field measurements. Even better, perhaps, or getting even more intense, would be to land on it. So we have landers, like um, the Venera probes on um, Venus, or the uh, rovers on Mars. Even more impressive would be a sample return mission where you're going to bring some samples back. The very most challenging of all missions, by far, is the crewed missions, where you actually send a person to a distant world. So the only one that's really been done so far was the Apollo program between 1969 and 1972. This is when I was um, a year old. Um, one of my very, very first memories um, is watching the launch of the last mission in 1972. Um, Apollo program, people on the moon. Amazing accomplishment to get all the stuff to the moon. So actually what they sent to the moon was a lander, two astronauts, and a really amazing dune buggy, which they could drive around on the moon. If you ever want to find, you know, go on YouTube and look up the uh, moon rover videos and watch them driving these things around, it's hilarious. Um, they traveled back and forth to the moon in this, uh, what's called the command module. The whole thing was assembled like this for the trip. All of this has to get launched into Earth orbit. So the Saturn V launch vehicle is the largest launch vehicle ever made to get all this stuff into space and get it to the moon, and then I managed to get them back. They brought back a lot of samples, and we've learned a lot about the moon from these samples. Um, incredibly challenging sorts of missions, um, incredibly expensive. Uh, basically, we haven't been doing them for decades. 
Now there's move to get back into this again. China and the U.S. are both tooling up again to go to the moon and hopefully, perhaps, someday to Mars. Although Mars seems like a pretty awful place to visit to me, but I'm not going, so that's all right. All right, Apollo program, people on the moon. Now, a few details we, we kind of brushed over. How do you power these things? So you've got this probe, you're trying to send it off to a distant world. How do you give it electricity? Um, these probes might need between 500 watts and 1,000 watts, depending on the probe. Sometimes a bit more than that, 1,500 watts. How do you provide that kind of power to a space probe? Well, if it's in the solar system, if it's in the inner solar system, out to Mars or maybe Jupiter, Juno, is right on the edge. So Juno actually is orbiting Jupiter and it's using, you can use solar panels that convert sunlight into electricity. Any farther than Jupiter, you probably can't use solar panels because there's just not enough sunlight. When you get to Saturn, the sun is so far away, it's so dim, there just isn't enough light to give you enough power with solar panels to power you. So for the outer solar system, you use what's called a radio isotope, iso, a radio isotope thermoelectric generator. What it basically does is it takes um, radioactive plutonium and uses it to generate electricity. So you, the plutonium has been built for um, atomic bombs. They take some of that, they put it into a, into a uh, RTG, and they can now get electric power for decades. It just doesn't run out. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 launched in the 70s. Their RTGs are still operating. Less, than, less power than they had originally. But they are, in fact, still continuing to operate, which is amazing after all these decades. Um, so RTGs, it's a great way to power. Here's, here's Cassini um, in orbit around Saturn. Cassini was powered by an RTG. Very, very cool. Um, now, what do you do when you want to land on Mars? How do you want to power it? Um, the first couple um, rovers use solar panels. But that turned out to be a problem because, well, it turns out that there's dust storms on Mars, and that dust can get, get onto the solar panels and start to cut the power. And also, of course, that, that they don't work at night. Um, and so uh, the, the newest rover uses an RTG as well, a nuclear power plant, to power it. Consequently, it should be able to run for indefinitely. We don't know how long it's going to run for until it breaks. It could be a very, very long time, which is pretty great. This lab traveling around on Mars exploring for years and years and years. It's going to be cool. All right, power. The next thing that we didn't really talk about, which is a really important question, is how do you, how do you communicate with it? These things are super far away. How do you communicate? The answer is you communicate using radio. But it's an incredibly long distance. The radio waves diverge and they get weaker, weaker and weaker. So in order to get the, enough signal to even see them, they have these huge dishes on Earth. This is the Deep Space Network dish in Goldstone, California. I think I believe it's a 70-meter dish that they point at the probe. The probes are all built with big dishes themselves to try and communicate back and forth. And so, I mean, when you look at a lot of these probes, the biggest thing you see is the communications dish. It's super important to have this big dish to get the radio sig to be able to receive and transmit the, the, the data back and forth. Very low data rates. Um, New Horizons, for example, is about two kilobits per second. It's very, very low data rate. It took more than a year for New Horizons to send back the images from the from passing Pluto. So, yeah, that's a that's a problem. Um, Jupiter is a lot closer, so Juno has a better time. It can get a lot more data back. Mars even easier. Nonetheless, um, these data rates are not like what you expect from home internet at all. They're pretty pretty low data rates. Um, the other thing is. These things are really, really, really far away. So light travel time makes for very long delays. It's only a few minutes from Mars. So it, the, the round trip time for Mars, it takes when, when Mars is close, is only a few minutes. So you send a command and you see if it worked a few minutes later. That's long, but it's not like some of the other things. For example, the round trip delay, round trip delay is 13 hours and 45 minutes to New Horizons. 13 hours to New Horizons. 42 hours round trip delay to Voyager 1. So when you send a command to Voyager 1, it reaches Voyager 1, 
Voyager 1 sends the information back, that whole round trip delay, almost two days. It's almost a day for the data from Voyager to get to us. Traveling at the speed of light. These distances are crazy. Um, so, yeah, communications, it's a challenge. Basically, big radio dishes that they point at the satellite to communicate to it. Now, there's a limited number of these big dishes, so each satellite only gets a certain amount of time per day because they, okay, now it's Voyager's turn, now it's Juno's turn. Okay, so they're changing around. Obviously, they could build more of these dishes, but they're big, they're expensive, and uh, the, the data rates are, are really quite low. So, we've talked about power, electrical power, um, solar panels or nuclear generators, basically, R RTGs. We've talked about communication, radio waves. Finally, the last thing to, to talk about is how do you get these things into space? And the answer is you have to build a rocket. So, um, how does a rocket work? We've got fuel and an oxidizer. So, when you burn things on Earth, oxygen in the air is the oxidizer. So, when you burn paper, it's com combining the paper with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water and heat. You need, for a rocket traveling into space, you can't bring your own oxidizer with you. You have to, ha so you can't, you, you, you have to bring your own oxidizer with you. You can't count on it from the air. Also, you need to burn so fast to get the thrust you need that um, you can't use the air with you even on the ground. So, a rocket will have a fuel tank and an oxidizer tank. That's what's in here. All of this is a fuel tank and then an oxidizer tank. Pumps to pump the fuel into the engine as fast as you can. These pumps are crazy. They're just belting the fuel into the, um, into the engine where it explodes and blows the fuel out the back. So here's a rocket engine being tested at a NASA facility. So basically these pumps are pumping fuel into the ex explosion chamber. It expands and blows out the back, giving this thrust. So it accelerates the fuel downwards, which pushes the rocket upwards. This right here is the Falcon Heavy. It's currently the largest um, a launch vehicle currently in operation. It can take 63,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit or 16,000 kilograms all the way to Mars. So that's impressive. Um, for their test flight, they sent um, Elon Musk's um, Tesla Roadster um, on an orbit that goes out past Mars just to show they could do it. So there is Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster with a mannequin traveling away from the Earth after being launched by a uh, Falcon Heavy. That's pretty silly. Um, right now, the U.S. has launch vehicles. This is their largest, but they have a number of them going all the way down to small sizes. Europe has a number of launch vehicles. Um, Russia has um, a very successful launch vehicle, and China has a, a new collection of launch vehicles. Again, a very wide range going from almost as large as the Falcon Heavy all the way down to very small vehicles. So, this is expensive, getting a spacecraft into space. Remember, you're trying to get it up to 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 kilometers an hour. This requires an enormous amount of fuel, an enormous amount of thrust. That's why these rockets are so big. Um, so, that's been a really quick summary of exploring the solar system. The four, the different types of missions, telescopes in Earth orbit to look at space, flyby missions that go by the target so you can get a better view, orbiters that get into orbit around it and, and can take pictures and make measurements for a very long time, landers that can go down onto the surface, rovers that can drive around on the surface, and finally return missions that bring back samples, or crewed return missions that, that go and explore the place and bring back samples. So these are the various, various types of missions. So as you hear missions showing up, you can be able to say to yourself, ah, that's a return mission, ah, that's an orbiter, ah, that's a rover. So, and you can think about some of the things that go into how these things work. So this has been a lot of fun. To finally finish things up, I want to talk about not Astro 101 content, but the kind of work that I do when I'm not teaching Astro 101, which lately hasn't been very much. These videos have been, well, an enormous amount of fun to make, but also quite a bit of a challenge. So what do I do for my research? Well, would you believe that I build telescopes and fly them on giant balloons? It's true, that's what I do. So let's, let's try to understand this. So let's start here. Um, remind ourselves that there are colors of light where the light from space never reaches the surface of the Earth. These submillimeter bands, x-ray bands. Also, remind ourselves that 
um, even in the visible light, even though light makes it to the ground, a lot of the light gets distorted by um, atmospheric seeing. So there is benefits to going to space to build telescopes. But we just talked about these rockets and how hard it is to get things into space. There's a way of doing it that's a lot less expensive, and that is using really, really huge balloons. NASA and the Canadian Space Agency uh, fly these giant balloons, which, um, well, here's a picture of it when it's fully inflated and partially inflated compared to, for example, the Washington Monument, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. If not, um, these are something like a million cubic meters of helium. They're very, very large balloons. They can take a balloon up to 40 kilometers altitude, and we can have a 3,000 kilogram payload, which is quite a bit, right? That's, that's, that's like an SUV of payload. And we can have flights up to 50 days long, which is, that's pretty cool. So let's take a look at uh, one of these launches just so we start to get ourselves introduced for what, what I'm doing. So um, a couple years ago, we were in Antarctica, and here's a launch that we had um, for one of, our, uh, one of our payloads. So if you look here, this is the balloon. The balloon comes all the way to here. The balloon is only partially inflated. Remember, it's going to go up to an altitude of 40 kilometers. So as it goes up and up, the gas inside the balloon is going to expand and expand and expand. We don't want the balloon to pop. And so we make the balloon, um, they make the balloon much larger than it needs to be to lift it. So as the balloon goes up, it's going to, it's going to expand and, and fully inflate. You can see the balloon, we can, it comes down to here. Um, then here is the parachute and the payload is down below us. Okay, so there's the, there's, the spy, there's, there's the payload hanging from the launch vehicle. Now the driver of the launch vehicle needs to drive and get the balloon above the payload and then they will release the payload from the launch vehicle and it should go up. So here we go, let's watch this happen. He's getting underneath, he's getting in the right place. And here we go. You can see this wall of solar panels to provide us with power. Um, we get around 1,500 watts from that wall of solar panels. It pops it off, here it goes. All right, and now the payload is going. This is a, this, this payload here actually was around 3,000 kilograms, fully loaded, and uh, up it goes. Okay, that's a launch. Here's a picture I took um, a couple hours later with the telephoto lens when the payload was at full altitude. You see that now the balloon is completely full. It's now at an altitude of 39 kilometers and the payload is completely inflated. The balloon then proceeded to fly for several weeks, um, traveling over Antarctica and uh, eventually landed on the ice shelf um, on the opposite side of the continent. Here they're, they've gone back to recover it. So that was the payload after landing. A little worse for wear, but it was recovered and we're gonna try and fly it again once COVID is over and we can actually get down to Antarctica for another flight. So that's one kind of flight from it. So the place that we can launch from, we can launch from um, Northern Sweden to fly over to Northern Canada. We could in principle keep going around, but um, Russia um, won't give NASA permission to fly over Russia because of, well, they like to fight with each other, I guess. So we have to stop in Canada. We can't go all the way around. Um, you can also fly from Antarctica. This is the kind of flights where you can go around and around the Antarctic continent. It turns out that during the austral summer, which is our winter, so in December and in January, the, the stratospheric winds in Antarctica go around and around the continent. So you can launch from the coast here, McMurdo, fly around and fly around, and you can have flights up to 50 days long, launching in December. Okay, so let's talk about some of the experiments that I've done, just for fun. The first one is an experiment called BLAST. Here's a bunch of words. The words mean stuff. Don't worry about it, except that it's a sub-millimeter telescope, sub-millimeter. This is looking at wavelengths of light that your eyes can't see and that also cannot make it through the atmosphere. What are we trying to look at? Here's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. You've seen the Milky Way before. You see these black bands. These black bands are, are dust. Inside these black bands is where star formation is taking place. You can see the star formation with sub-millimeter light because it makes it through the dust. So if you want to see places where stars are forming, you want to build a submillimeter telescope and look at the sky, you cannot do this from the ground. Um, you have to do it from a balloon or from space. So this blast tested the detectors that were later used in the Herschel Space Telescope we talked about in the, in the beginning. So 
um, BLAST was a test bed for those detectors and also got some of the first data in the submillimeter. Um, super interesting. Uh, here is a, a picture of um, the payload and pointing system. Basically, um, yeah, don't worry about it. It's, it's just a big thing. Fully loaded, it's around two and a half tons. So it's a, it's a monster. Here's where we go down to fly it from. This is McMurdo Station on the coast of Antarctica, um, extinct volcano here. Um, it's a great place because you live in a dorm, which is wonderful. Um, you eat in a cafeteria, which is great because you don't have to cook, and there's no money for thousands of miles. So it's really kind of like an academic's paradise. Okay, so um, McMurdo Station, Antarctica, we spent a couple of months down there. Um, out here at the balloon facility where we have these buildings. Um, this building here, well, these two buildings here, um, these turn out to be the largest buildings in the world that are on skis, right? There had to be the largest building in the world on skis. Well, there they are. Um, they're on skis so they can drag them away so that, and, and move them around so they don't end up with getting snow drifts in. Otherwise, they end up all getting drifted in and they, and they get, get buried. So they're on skis so they can move them around. Um, inside, the, inside these buildings is where we put the telescope together. So here's BLAST just in its initial stages of, of assembly. Um, a couple of my grad students down there. Um, really fun time. Okay, and this is one of the NASA engineers as well. Okay, so um, here's BLAST now assembled. There's the main mirror. Um, there's some tracking cameras, um, shields to keep sunlight off the detectors. Uh, there it is getting ready to fly. This, these right here are the solar panels again. It's solar powered. Another picture of it here, solar powered. Um, blast on the launch field, getting ready to launch. And there it's been launched. Goodbye blast. Um, the next 10, 15 days are, in, well, this is what we do. We watch the data coming in and look for anything going wrong. Now, BLAST should just drive itself without any commands from us. It should be like, it has a list of what it should be doing next. It should just follow it, and it does pretty well, but occasionally things will break. Something will go wrong, like, ah, the gyroscope's broke. Switch to the backups, or whatever. So that, or a computer just crashed, reboot it, things like that. But mostly, it just runs by itself for days and days, and we sit and we watch the plots, and we're bored until something bad happens which it did a couple times. But it actually was a remarkably great flight. It was awesome. We launched here from McMurdo. It blew around. It got to here. Um, our detectors require liquid helium to stay cold so that, that, so that they're sensitive. The liquid helium runs out after about 10 days. So we got to a good spot to land. They said, OK, let's go ahead and land it, get the payload back, get the data back. All the data is stored on the payload because our data rates are not near high enough to get the, to, to get the images back to us. So we have to re actually recover the hard disks. Um, Okay, there is blast on the parachute coming into land. That's great. Um, well, this is an interesting story. Um, people go to Antarctica to do adventurous things, like we did. We go down to fly a payload. But people go down to Antarctica to do other things, like like para skiing across Antarctica, right? So you get a you get a parachute, you got skis, you catch the wind, and you kind of ski across Antarctica. Sounds like an adventure. Um, this was in 2006, the early days of blogs and. There was a group that had an Iridium phone so they could write their blog as they tried to ski across Antarctica. And they were complaining at this time that Antarctica was a terrible place, terrible place to ski because there's no wind. But they were on the opposite side from where Blast landed. Where Blast landed, there was not this problem. There was a lot of wind. And not only that, the explosive bolt that's supposed to cut the parachute away from the payload, that whole system failed. And so the wind caught the parachute and was dragging it across Antarctica. There it is. Blast dragging across Antarctica faster than you can run. This was not good. It turned out that Blast dragged for 140 miles, something like that, um, before it got stuck in a crevasse field. Uh, whole adventure getting the data back. Lots of prayer, but we got it back and we got some great data. It was in the end, it was a very successful experiment. Um, so here's the spot we looked at. You can see the dark dust, right? So here's a, here's a close-up of it. You can see the dark dust in here. Inside, buried in this dust, star formation is happening. So this is visible light. If you look at the exact same spot with blast in submillimeter light, you see this. Where it's blue, blue, is where dust is being warmed up above 20 Kelvin. That's where star formation has already happened. These are 
groups of very young, very, very, very hot stars. The red is cold dust, which is collapsing to form new stars. So if we look at this region and we zoom into this, we can see this right here. New stars forming in all of these spots. So really, really cool. So we were able to see where star formation is happening and get a census of how much star formation is happening in this region. Super interesting, really cool. We also looked at distant galaxies and saw where star formation was happening in them. And we were able to map out the history of star formation and determine the source of what's called the cosmic infrared background. This light coming from all directions that no one knew, really, really knew what it was. We were able to show that it was actually coming from stars forming in very ancient galaxies seven billion years ago. So super interesting. Okay, that was BLAST. We flew BLAST a couple more times, 2010, 2012, um, learned about how magnetic fields affect star formation. There's the team um, for one of our flights uh, down in Antarctica. People from Toronto, UBC, Pennsylvania, Northwestern, Miami, Brown, Cardiff, and UCL. Okay, so that is BLAST. Another experiment I've worked on, which is kind of fun. Um, remember, in the first lecture, we talked about this radiation from the beginning of the universe called the cosmic microwave background, looking back to the very beginning of time. So uh, we built a telescope to do that called Boomerang. We flew it in 1998 and 2003. Um, here's a map of that plasma that we made. This is the size of the moon. This is the a bunch of sky. This is looking at the universe like it was, um, well, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This is uh, one of this is one of the first, or this is one of the very first images of the plasma with this, anything like this kind of resolution and uh, sensitivity. So um, from that, from analyzing these ripples, um, how big they are in, in intensity, how big they are in size, basically looking at their distribution and structure, we we're able to pull out of it the content of the plasma. And from, and from that, we could pull out the content of the universe. And for example, we discovered that the universe is made of you know, a few percent normal matter, more dark matter, and mostly dark energy, which we don't know what that is at all. So this was a super cool and exciting result. Um, yeah, we were actually on the front page of the New York Times. Can you imagine? Okay, and Time Magazine and Newsweek, and it was, it was, it was pretty nuts. This is around 2001, 2002. So very cool experiment, boomerang. Okay, what else? Um, so continuing to look at that primordial plasma, um, I worked for a while on an experiment called Planck, which is a satellite. That's over and done. Currently, we're working on an experiment called um, SPIDER. SPIDER is a balloon-borne polar emitter, again, looking at this cosmic microwave background. Lots of words. You can ignore them. You should admire how beautiful SPIDER is. This is something like a four-ton telescope. Amazing. So what we're trying to do, it turns out that in the early universe, there may have been gravitational waves produced. Those gravitational waves may cause distortions in space-time which can distort the way things look that are very distant. So here's a picture of what, for example, this, it's a, ignore the colors, um, what this cosmic microwave background might look like without the gravitational waves. Look at these little black lines. These are showing the direction of what's called a polarization. Um, this is with the gravitational waves. So we're trying to measure this, 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 this difference between this and this. Uh, Okay, the difference between this and this. Very, very subtle difference. Maybe you can't see it. Well, it's really, really hard to see. Again, back to Antarctica, we fly down in a, in a C-17, which is a very cool airplane, like, you know, the height of luxury. Here it is inside the C-17. Okay, maybe not so luxurious. These are cargo being shipped down, various experiments down to Antarctica, and then we get to ride on the side. Okay, well, it's fine. Um, lands on the ice in Antarctica. Again, here's our town, here's the dorms we live in. They have windmills now for part of the power. Again, our base out there. Um, here's the team for Spider from a variety of institutions. A bunch of them are from actually from Toronto as well. Um, uh, you spend a few months building stuff in Antarctica. It's all very exciting. It's beautiful down there. These are the Royal Society Mountains. This is the airfield that we landed at. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's Antarctica, so you have penguins. It's an emperor penguin. This is an Adelie penguin. They're very cute. 
here we are getting ready to launch it. Here's the wall of solar panels to provide it the power on the launch vehicle. Flying again. So here is, during the flight, it's between 35 and 37 kilometers bouncing up and down each day. But it's staying way, way up in the sky, well above any effect of the atmosphere. This is the path of this flight launched here. It got to here. The, the projections were that it was going to blow out to sea. This is a reasonably good place to land it because they could come by with the traverse and pick it up. So we landed there and uh, they came by to pick it up, which was great. I flew home in a C-130, which is, again, not exactly luxury, but there you go, C-130. And um, when I got home, I discovered my wife had bought a dog. So hello, Marco. You're now our dog. Last experiment I want to talk about, something we're working on now, is called Superbit. Here's, our, here's the team for Superbit. Um, when we launched it in, just a little over a year ago, up in Timmins, Ontario. Um, so these are people from Toronto and from Cardiff and from Princeton University. Um, here's a picture of the sky from the balloon. Isn't that cool? Just taped a GoPro on. And this is sunrise over the balloon. You can see the earth, you can see the atmosphere. We're above the atmosphere. Oh man, that is so cool. Okay, so what's Superbit about? Superbit is a visible light telescope. We're trying to do the same sort of things that the Hubble Space Telescope does. Um, camera technology has come a long way since Hubble was launched. So here's an example of an image from Hubble. This is how much coverage Hubble has. Um, our camera covers a much larger area. So that's the same part of the sky that we took with in one of our engineering flights. Now, the telescope we had for this flight was not fully there. Um, it didn't have good focus. So this, this image is not in focus. And this is a very short exposure. Um, it's only 18 minutes instead of the um, many, many, many hours um, that we would normally want to do. But you, but you can get the idea of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build a telescope that will have not quite the same resolution as Hubble Space Telescope, but still a lot better than on the ground with a sky coverage the size of the image much, much larger than what Hubble can do. So it should be a very interesting experiment. Um, we got it to work last, um, last September, and so now we're waiting for the really long flight. Another picture from one of our test flights, just a galaxy, some galaxies, and it's just kind of neat how this thing works. The, the goal here is to launch the balloon from New Zealand. Here's, an, here's one of the test flights of the balloon. Launch the balloon from New Zealand and have the wind just blow it around. This, this flight, I believe, was 45 days. So this is the goal. Launch it, get it up there for 45 days, and uh, really uh, get a ton of really great visible light telescope data. So we're kind of excited about that. Um, we were going to try and fly this coming spring. COVID, among other things, kind of messed that up. So we don't know when we're going to be able to fly. Hopefully it'll be in a year and a half. The telescope is in the high bay at Toronto waiting for a chance to go launch it. So come on, we want to launch this thing. Summary, the experiments I've been working on, spider looking at the very early universe, a tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, boomerang looking a bit later, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, blast, 7 billion years after the Big Bang, superbit, kind of medium ga galaxies, blast pole looking at star formation close to us now. So it's been kind of fun looking at experiments from a wide range of times, and we're always thinking of kind of new and exciting things to do. In fact, um, we're starting to work on a instrument that's going to try and look at the atmospheres of very hot planets living very close to stars other than the sun, so extrasolar planets. And so we've just been funded to build a telescope to look at that, look at their atmospheres. And you'll be hearing a little bit about looking for extrasolar planets in a couple of lectures. Um, and so we're going to try and get into that game too. So in a couple of years, maybe we'll be measuring that. So lots of really awesome science to do and we just keep, keep having fun. And anyway, I've had so much fun with this class. I hope you guys have too. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess I won't be seeing you again. It's been really fun. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the semester. And uh, good luck on the last assignment and on your exams. Thanks. Stay safe.